Now, all this week, Mobile World Live has been looking at how operators can move beyond just being providers of connectivity. We focused on new services that operators can launch in the move to 5G. And we've analyzed how operators can differentiate themselves in a 5G service era by new billing business models. Well, in this special program today, we're going to be discussing some of the hottest trends in service packaging, as well as reviewing some perhaps surprising 5G use cases. I've got three expert guests with me to lead the debate. First up, I'd like to introduce Gregor Blenerud. Gregor is Strategic Marketing Director at Ericsson. Welcome, Gregor. Thank you, Justin. Also joining us is Gregor's colleague, John Yasley. John is Head of Fixed Wireless Access at Ericsson. Welcome, John. Thank you, Justin. And we also have the Head of Analyst House GSMA Intelligence, Peter Yarrick. Welcome, Peter. Hi, everyone. So let's kick off with an overview of some of the latest trends in service packaging. Um, Gregor, you took part in a webinar this week that took a really comprehensive look at the market. Can you therefore summarize what's happening in this space? Yes, of course. So uh, as we discussed yesterday, we, we have surveyed over 300 or 309 to be precise uh, mobile operators around the world, looking at how they package and, and uh, provide their, their service packaging towards uh, consumers. Uh, and uh, what we're seeing here is, is there's one, one really clear uh, trend or, or has been prevailing for quite some time is, is the bucket model that it seems like everybody is using uh, as the base model, so selling gigabytes to consumers. And all but four operators are actually using this model uh, as a base baseline offer. Uh, then we have the unlimited model, which is actually these four uh, operators that are not doing the, the bucket. They have shifted over to doing only unlimited and using speed as their, their way of, of uh, differentiating between the tiers. We have uh, then, as we can see here in, in the slide, some other variants. So we have uh, variations on the theme of the bucket model, like uh, nighttime or, or uh, that type of package where, where operators provide a discount for the uh, when, when the network is, is less loaded at night or during weekends. We have family and share plans, which is another variation on the bucket theme where you share a bucket between family members or across different devices. We have uh, bundles of triple and quad play where uh, operators package together with you know, mobile broadband, mobile phone, mo fixed broadband maybe, and, and uh, media services. We have, uh, of course, looked at, at 5G launches and, and uh, you know, whether or not, and, and one, one particular interest here was whether or not operators were actually able to charge a premium for 5G over um, 4G, which has been quite a, an important question to everybody, whether uh, operators will actually be able to, to charge uh, or recoup the, the, the cost of, of uh, launching 5G. And around 30, sixty percent of the operators are actually charging a, a, a premium, and, and it's, it's a quite significant premium that we're seeing uh, across the board. Uh, we have then, uh, in relation to 5G, uh, quite interesting changes and, and development and, and a, a rapid increase in, in some areas. And, and one uh, worth mentioning is the service-based packaging, which kind of targets new services. And rather than, than just having you uh, use your bucket or unlimited for anything you want, you, the operators package or wrap around a particular service. And, and the most common ones and the ones of interest for us in this have been high-end uh, services like video streaming and music streaming. So here they, they create packages around that that allows them to have a different price point per gigabyte for uh, video streaming, for example. Another area of interest in, in relation to 5G and, and IoT is, of course, device-based packaging, where you sell a device and maybe focus more on the, on the device and device capabilities rather than, than the gigabytes that, that it, or megabytes or kilobytes even that it uses. 
And then, of course, we have uh, fixed wireless access, which we have seen a dramatic increase in. And over the course of, of one year, where it's gone from 105 operators to 185 operators who are offering this to consum consumers. Um, and I think this is a quite interesting and even surprising uh, development that we've seen in, in such a short period of time. Thank you, Gregor. Um, Peter, you spend a lot of time uh, at GSMA Intelligence tracking global market trends. Um, does, does what Gregor just explained kind of uh, coincide with, uh, with your takeaways as well as what's going on in the market at the moment? No, definitely a hundred percent. I mean, the concept of service bundling isn't new, right? It's been around since the beginning of when operators started looking at doing more than voice, right? When they added voice and mobile and data and, and, and video, right? That, that obviously they looked at to bundle it up to deliver value. But every time you see a new network technology, right? 4G and, and now 5G, there is this opportunity to say, how do we get more of that than connectivity out of it, right? And so how do we put these things together? It's clearly something that operators are looking to do in order to capture really capture a bigger part of the revenue that, that consumers are spending, but also deliver more value, right? And, and so I think you see this interest. And you know, one of the things we've seen from, from our research is that consumers don't necessarily think of innovative services first and foremost from 5G, right? They think about speed, um, you know, they think about maybe getting more data out of it, but you can see there are clearly new services and even just the fact that you can deliver data more efficiently opens up those services opportunities. So the question is, how do you get them to, to move on those? And looking at bundling is, is one of the ways that you can start thinking about that. And so it's definitely something that, that, that operators are looking at and that totally matches what we're seeing. We're hearing lots of talk, as Gregor said, uh, about fixed wireless access technology, especially really given the demands for home broadband services, well, it's skyrocketed uh, this year, as many of us, of course, work from home due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, is it fair to say then, Gregor, that fixed wireless access is becoming an obvious 5G use case? Yeah, I would think so, uh, absolutely. And, and in fact, Ericsson has had it as, as one of the, the clear use cases for 5G in, in our roadmap, so to speak, uh, on the side of, of uh, mobile broadband being the, the, the obvious and, and big one, of course. Uh, at the same time, it has a little bit taken us by surprise, I would say, the, the rapid increase in, in, in interest from operators. And, and it's clear in discussion in discussing with operators, there's a, uh, clearly a, a different sort of attitude towards this and, and, and self-confidence, I would say, in, in launching things like this. And we're even seeing uh, from a traffic perspective, uh, when we did our latest uh, update in the Ericsson Mobility Report, for the first time we actually show the numbers and the traffic numbers and, and the forecast uh, within the five-year uh, period is, is that mobile or fixed wireless access will take up 25% of the traffic in the mobile networks. Let's bring in John. Uh, John, fixed wireless access, of course, it's not a new technology. Um, what do you think we've learned from some of those early fixed wireless access experiences? Because, of course, we had it with 3G. Uh, we had it with something uh, many of us will, will remember called WiMAX. Um, what, what have you learned from those earlier deployments? That's a very good question. And I think uh, it's very important to learn from the past and see what is the difference now. Uh, I would say there are three main differences. Uh, the first one is uh, we are building multi-purpose networks, especially when we think about 5G. Uh, it's not only one network for mobile broadband. That will be a network for mobile broadband, IoT, uh, and fixed wireless access and other services. So that's a network that stands on multiple legs. Uh, if you just think about WiMAX, maybe you're building a network for only one service. Then I think the, the other... Uh, two uh, differences I think is related to scale. Uh, one is scale of the ecosystem to develop technology, uh, 3GPP uh, with uh, 4G and then 5G coming. Uh, you have a lot of innovation investment around that. You have a lot of new spectrum um, and you're gonna continue to have innovation that will bring additional capacity uh, able to serve these uh, different type of use cases. Then I think it's very important also uh, not to forget the scale of the device ecosystem that you have. Uh, our industry, we have a billions of users. And of course, when you have these billions of users, uh, you're going to have a, a lot of variety of devices, and then your price points really go down. Uh, so I think that is a very important advantage that uh, we've uh, the previous technologies, either because they were regional or they were like uh, 
non true GPP or niche technologies, you could not have those advantages. Peter, I remember talking to you uh, 10, 15 years ago in, in previous lives about uh, the potential uh, for WiMAX. Um, tell us a little bit about your thoughts on how we can learn from, from those earlier fixed wireless access experiences over previous technology. Yeah, I completely agree with, with what we just heard in terms of, of, you know, what's different, right? I think, you know, the, the multi-purpose side of things, yes, there were aspirations and we'll give sort of the, the WiMAX crew and, and maybe even some other proprietary technologies some credit there. They, they wanted to be mobile, right? They didn't get there, but, but they wanted to. But I think the scale part is really important, right? Scale of the industry, scale on the device side of things. And you're right, you know, back then I remember those days building your models of, of what adoption would look like. And it's crazy just the, the impact of a decrease in price on devices versus networks. And, and you know, all those technologies, particularly other proprietary ones, they were doing some really cool stuff on the network side of things, right? You know, we talk about massive MIMO now. They were talking about beamforming. They were doing what they could to, to decrease prices from the network side of things. But the device costs, the device scale really makes the business model. And so I think, I think that's, that's critical and, and you're seeing that play out particularly with LTE, but obviously going forward, we, we'll, we'll hope for the same stuff from 5G. I would just add in one other thing, it, it's we see a, a new push on connecting the unconnected now, whether that's in rural areas of developed markets or uh, on you know, developing countries. Uh, and I think you see that reflected in national broadband plans. And so beyond sort of the, the supply side of things, right, the technologies that will actually make this work, you have that demand and you have sort of national interests that are trying to drive that. So I think that all comes together to make fixed wireless, you know, as we looked at in some recent research we did around rural connectivity, really an important part of the puzzle, along with all the other broadband technologies to make sure that we're hitting those connectivity goals. To finish up, um, let's talk about how operators can best build a profitable fixed wireless access case. Um, John, briefly, what would be your advice to operators uh, looking to go down this path? So. I think uh, operators need to see fixed wireless as an incremental uh, business case to their existing uh, mobile broadband business. Because, uh, and then there are three steps. I think the first one is really utilize what they already have. Uh, they have a lot of assets to leverage uh, from uh, sites. I mean, in our, we see uh, mobile networks covering uh, 90% of the population. Uh, so those sites, uh, and that's a tremendous asset. Another asset you utilize is spectrum. Uh, operators have a lot of spectrum, and in many cases, these are not fully deployed across the whole network. So just uh, taking the example from Peter, for rural areas, operators maybe deploy 20, 30% of their spectrum assets in those areas, but they have the other 70, 80% of the spectrum that they already bought. If they deploy that on those areas, uh, they can serve uh, users. And these are things that, uh, it's already paid for, uh, so it's utilizing the assets. Then I think the second step is about adding. You would add additional capacity, additional radios or transmission to support uh, those uh, new users. And then only once you uh, utilize all of that, then you're gonna build new sites. And, and that's the third step, what we call Densify. So I think fixed wireless is uh, an incremental business case. It's a scalable business case that you invest as you grow. It's not like fiber that you put a lot of uh, upfront costs before you have any customers. Here you have a network that uh, you can only add uh, an increment as you're gonna get uh, additional business. So I think uh, that that is the uh, our uh, toolbox for uh, building profitable fixed wireless business cases. Well, gentlemen, we are unfortunately out of time, but it's been a great discussion. Uh, some great insight. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us as part of Mobile World Live's themed weeks. Thank you. Thank you.